welcome everyone to our Better Breathers Club. So we had a little bit of a miscommunication, so no one's here in person, but we are going to record this presentation by Aaron Gallion, who wrote the book Badass Advocate, and then we're going to share it on our YouTube and then on Facebook with all of our patients. And we'd like to encourage each of you to check out her website, badassadvocate.com. There's tons of resources on there. And then also look at her book on Amazon. Um, and she has tons of good strategies in the book. And so that can help you, whether you're going to be um, advocating for yourself or advocating for a loved one, a friend, a family member, somebody that goes to church with you, someone that who you work with. And so I wanted to get started today. I'm going to read a little bit about the author, about Erin, and then I will pass the time off to her for the presentation. And then at the very end, I'll just ask her a few questions and then we'll close. So Erin Mulqueen, or Mulqueen Gallion is a professional author and public speaker who trains sales professionals in effective communication with healthcare providers. She lost her father to non-Hodgkin's lymphoma in 1997 and her sister to a rare lung disease in 2018. Fueled by these heartbreaking personal experiences, Erin decided her vision is to help others powerfully advocate for the seriously ill loved one in their life. And so without further ado, I'd like to pass the time off to Erin Gallion for her pre presentation. Thank you, Tyler. Thank you for having me today. So um, no problem that no one's here. It's OK. It's we'll, we'll go through some core strategies that are in the book. If you were able to read the book, great. Um, I know Tyler read it, so he's going to have some follow up questions and um, anyone is also always welcome to reach out to me afterwards. So if you go to my website, badassadvocate.com, my contact information is in there and it's just Aaron at badassadvocate.com. So feel free to reach out if you have any other follow up questions that we didn't get to today. So as Tyler mentioned, I'm going to share a few strategies and we'll kind of dive a little bit deeper into them. So these are great, not only for yourself, but also, as Tyler mentioned, if you're advocating for someone else, they're the same strategies and I'll kind of touch on that. So Tyler mentioned my story, my background, and I'm just going to uh, dive a little bit more into it. So here is my father, Mike. I love to show this picture because it is just really tells the, the picture of how my father was and the kind of dad he was. He was so much fun, fun loving, just a warm, wonderful father. And in 1997, my father was diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. He was just 53 years old and 13 months later, or I'm sorry, 10 months later, he passed away. My family was heartbroken. You know, my dad brought so much joy and laughter to our house. You know, so I'm sure others can relate to the loss of a loved one and how that really impacts your life. And so I have two siblings, a sister and a brother. And so my mom and my siblings and I, you know, we went through the grieving process and we would talk a lot about my dad, share his cheesy jokes and tell his funny stories. And 20 years later, my sister Megan, who is on my left there, was diagnosed with the same cancer as my father. Um, supposedly, it's just coincidental. I don't know. They both had non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, but they had different strains. And at this point in time, that's all that we know that it was unrelated and just a bad coincidence. So my sister was 47 at the time. And up until this point, she had been healthy. She was a mom of two young girls. She's a former collegiate athlete. She was still heavily involved in the sport of lacrosse and she prided herself on living a healthy life. And so she contracted cancer, probably had it for about a year and didn't know it. And then the cancer caused an autoimmune disease and then the autoimmune disease caused a very rare and aggressive lung disease. And so unfortunately, that lung disease really took a toll on my sister and her body, um, her little 5-2 frame. So she went through cancer, the chemo treatments, and the good news was is that the cancer was curable. And about five, six months later, she was cancer-free. So we celebrated that. We were so happy and thrilled for her that she got through cancer. But unfortunately, the lung disease continued to progress. Because she went through chemo, she could not, her pulmonologist could not address the lung disease. And that just mean it had more time to worsen. And so over this time, um, I live in here in Texas, and my sister lived in Charleston, South Carolina. And so I would fly back and forth when I could to support her and my mom and my brother-in-law and my, my brother and my family that lived close by to help them and advocate for my sister. So I was, you know, advocating for her and there's something that I realized. 
for over 20 years, I've been in the pharmaceutical industry. And of course, I didn't get into the industry for this, but it ended up being to my benefit that what I had learned along my career, all of these experiences and the knowledge that I gained, and now I was training other reps how to speak to physicians and handle difficult conversations. All of these things were helping me to advocate for my sister. And so when my sister was in and out of the hospital and I was there with her, I realized that you know I would see other patients and sometimes they didn't have an advocate or sometimes I would you know hear people not know what to ask the physician or maybe be intimidated by asking questions. I would see that as a rep too, just being in the doctor's office and, and overhearing conversations. So it really was to my advantage that I knew how to speak to physicians. I was comfortable doing so. I was able to ask good questions. I didn't know anything about my sister's lung disease. Like I said, it was very rare. And so having this knowledge of how to have this skill set, I should say, maybe not the knowledge, but the skill set to ask good questions really was to my benefit. And so when my sister was sick, I would speak to her phys physicians and I asked them, you know, do you think what what I've learned along the way and, and the tactics that I use could help other families. And they said, absolutely, because a lot of people don't know what to ask and they don't know what to do. So unfortunately in October of 2018, my sister Megan did pass away from that lung disease. And after her loss, I was devastated. My sister and I were best friends since the day I was born. And she was just this loving, sweet soul, just like my father, actually. They were, they had a lot in common. And so I was heartbroken and it took me a while to get through that tough period of grief. And of course I will grieve for the rest of my life, but I have managed to work through it. And part of that was writing this book, Badass Advocate. And I wanted to give back to other families while also honoring my sister and my father. I didn't really advocate for my dad. I was only 20 years old and I was away at college when he was sick for most of the part. So I, I wasn't as involved. And so when my sister was diagnosed, I made sure I was going to be involved in her care and advocating for her and having a voice and doing whatever I needed to do, even if it was uncomfortable for me, to get her the best care possible. And that's what Badass Advocate is about. And that's what I'm going to speak about today. Just a side note, the other thing is I am accredited in a, a few different programs. So I share this because these things that I've learned along the way were helping me to better communicate and understand how to build these relationships with the doctors and the nurses, probably even more important, right? Those nurses are with you all the time and really help Megan get the best care possible. So let's dive into what we're gonna talk about today. So number one is build a support team. And if you've read the book or if you haven't and you haven't gotten into it yet, you'll see, and I know Ty will know this, it is the first thing, it's the first strategy that I talk about because it's the base of everything. Everything goes back to the support team. And if you haven't read it, it's okay, because I'm gonna give you some tips there. Then we're gonna talk about asking impactful questions. I feel like this is the one of the most difficult things for us to do with physicians or nurses. What do we ask? How do we ask good questions? So I'm gonna give you some techniques for that. And then there is a technique that we use in the pharmaceutical world or sales world for handling difficult conversations. It's a simple technique. It takes a little practice. You can use it on anyone, even your family members, um, not just the healthcare providers. And so I'll, I'll share that with you. And then last, I will share a powerful morning routine that I came up with. So I don't know if any of you remember this boy, Maddie Stepanek. Maddie Stepanek used to be on Oprah back in, mm, I don't know if it was the 90s or the 80s, but anyway, I think it was the 90s. And he died at 13 from this rare form of muscular dystrophy. But Maddie was such a big personality and big voice. Um, he was just such an impressive little boy. And I love to share this quote from Maddie. He said, unity is strength. When there is teamwork and collaboration, wonderful things can be achieved. <clears throat> and I agree. That's why I start off with the support team. So I share this because... You should never go to long, whether you're the patient or the caregiver, you always need a team behind you. And some of you may think, well, that's really hard for me. So I'm going to give you some ideas of how to create a strong team. And even if you have lots of family around you that are involved, you know, you, you want to strategize on how you can 
leverage their personalities, their strengths to your advantage. So number one, before you get started, you want to brainstorm with the caregiver, or if you are a caregiver in this scenario, you want to brainstorm with the patient. And you want to think about who do you want to be part of that core team? Now, you may have other people outside of your core team, this core circle that you're going to include in your day-to-day -day care or week-to-week. -week. Maybe it's if it's not on a daily basis, that's fine. My sister really needed day-to-day -day care. However often you need support, think about who you want to be a part of that core team. That's really important. And so you want to brainstorm. What qualities do you want? What who are you comfortable being around all the time in your house, in the hospital, wherever you are? There may be times where things are maybe very sensitive information, or maybe it's an uncomfortable situation, like you know, having to help you change into your pajamas or go to the bathroom or whatever. I, it depends. Everyone's situation is different. But whatever it is, you want to make sure you have people that you're comfortable having in that scenario. So think about that. Um, even if it's not that extreme today, if it will be maybe in the future, who do you want to be part of that core team and who is really knowledgeable and can support you? Do you have someone in your family who's a healthcare provider? Could they be part of that core team to help you have these better conversations with physicians and nurses? Okay, this is probably the number one question I get is, what if I don't have any family close by? Because sometimes you have family close by, but they're not really involved. You just can't get them to do anything. Or they don't live close by. You know, sometimes we grow up and we move away. And so I was one of those family members. You know, I mentioned I live in Texas and my sister lived in South Carolina. You don't have to live down the street to be a part of that core team. You certainly can be impactful. So there's a couple of things. If you don't have any of that, let's just eliminate family altogether in this scenario. You need to get creative. So think about people in your area who could support you. So think about this. It could be a nonprofit. So think of local nonprofits, obviously the Leukemia, um, the American Lung Association, you know, we're talking about that today. There are also other nonprofits or communities around you that could help and support you. There are people that get involved, let's say with the American Lung Association, if they're involved in volunteer like myself, like Tyler, you know, you get involved. Why? Because you've had a loved one that's dealt with a lung disease. Maybe you've dealt with it personally and you want to give back. You want to be a part of it. So this is a great opportunity to tap into. I mean, the American Lung Association has fantastic resources. So you want to be creative. Think about church. Tyler mentioned church at the start. OK, so with church, who is a part of your church that could help you? My sister was part of a church in Charleston, and when we all went to work, my sister was home. We couldn't just sit there all the time, right? It just wasn't easy to maintain that over a long period of time. So my brother-in-law asked some ladies from church who were retired who loved to come and sit with my sister. They didn't have to have a medical degree. They didn't have to do anything medical-wise, but they were just there to help my sister to the bathroom or just to keep her company and make sure she was okay. So think creative. Also, how about these things? Like if you have a neighbor and taking out the trash is just too much, maybe for you, or just one other thing on the list of things to do if you're the caregiver, ask maybe a neighborhood teenage boy to come over and take out the trash every Tuesday. Those are little things, but they support you along the way. So just start getting creative of how can people help you and who do you want to be involved in that core team? And there also, of course, are paid resources, right? You can have home care. You can have other people come in that um, pay professional patient advocates exist out there where you pay someone to be your advocate. I speak to those professionals a lot about how they're advocating for patients. They do that. A lot of them are former nurses that are so passionate and see the healthcare industry and how patients really need support. So they do that for a living. So there are so many resources out there start to get creative and think outside the box. If you have a caregiver or if you are the caregiver, brainstorm together and get creative as to who else you can get involved. One thing before I move on is I did mention family members who live far away. So I was one of those. So I wanna give you a couple of ideas. If you have a family member that lives far away and does wanna help, they can't be there all the time. I had a family of my own, I had a two-year-old at the time. So I made sure that I did things that 
my family couldn't do locally. Like, for example, or maybe could they could do it, but they didn't want to do it. For example, communicating between my sister and my mom, who was her main caregiver, and my extended family back in Philadelphia. That's where we grew up. So that's a lot on my mom's shoulders and on my sister's shoulders to have to communicate all the updates. So I handled all that. I made sure that I set up text message groups and I would keep them abreast as to what was going on with my sister. And sometimes they want to know, like, I want to send your mom something because she needs support. What could I get her? I was that point person. I communicated that with my family. So they knew that they could still text or call whoever they wanted, but they did not have to. That was just an extra burden in a way of having to handle all the communication. So keep that in mind. You can have someone be that point person. I also could set up meal trains. You can do a lot on the internet. You can do research. Um, so you can set up a GoFundMe if that's necessary. So think of how you can leverage people's strengths and knowledge to your advantage. Tyler, at this point, do you have any questions about this? Before I move on? No, I don't think so. And <clears throat> I think you did a great job. I was only thinking of people locally, but like you said, you could find nonprofits and all sorts of different people around you that could help neighbors. So yeah, our network, thankfully, with all the interconnectedness of internet and FaceTime, you could really use people all over the country and even the world to help you out. Absolutely. And you just brought up something I never speak about, but like thinking about even Facebook, right? There are all these Facebook groups that are support. Like I know that there's grief support groups because I'm in some of those, but I would imagine there are things with lung disease, you know, Better Breathers Club. I'm sure maybe there's something on Facebook for that. But, you know, think outside the box. You don't have to just leverage one nonprofit. You could see who else is locally that can support you. And like I said, consider other strengths. So when we were talking about um, setting up a meal train or a GoFundMe, I have a daughter who's 16. She is so good at technology, as we all know, young people are good at technology, right? Leverage that. Do you have a niece or a nephew or a grandchild or, you know, a sibling that is so good in this area that they can easily set that up for you? And maybe they're not a part of your core support team. I mean, maybe they are, but maybe you don't need that, but they will set up some things to support you along the way. Okay, so just get creative and think about what you need and who can support you. And don't be afraid to ask for help. Okay, so now we've talked about how to build a strong support team. Let's talk about maintaining that because it's one thing to set up a strong support team, but how do you keep them together? And I will say, I think of this almost in a business sense, right? So you hire people, right? That's building your support team. In business, you hire people, but then you don't just let them go do their job, right? You communicate, you want to coach them, you want to support them. You do the same thing with your support team. Number one is create communication chains. This was really core for my family because we had my brother, my brother-in-law, and myself are all working professionals. My mom's retired. We need to communicate with my mom and my sister and know what's going on because they went to the doctor's office. So we wanted to be up to date as to what's going on, how can we help, how can we support, what do you need? And then also talk about, oh, there's an upcoming doctor's appointment. Let's talk about what that's going to be like. Why are we going to that pulmonologist? What are we going to talk about? And what questions can we ask? We also set up meetings. So we did not do this as much as now reflecting back. I wish we did. So this is my way of paying it forward and giving you tips to be a better badass advocate than, than we were. But we only did this toward the, the end of my sister's illness. And we had a family meeting. And my sister was so sick that she wasn't a part of this meeting. Now, I would say if you are the patient or if you're a caregiver and the patient's well enough and healthy enough, and definitely include them. They need to be part of that. At this point, my sister was in the hospital and she was really sick. So we did not have her um, be a part of it at this point because we were trying to strategize and support her. So it just depends on your situation. But you want to set up these meetings to talk, to open up that line of communication and make sure that you are planning out next steps. Where do you need support? Is it financial support? Is it that the meals? Is it maybe the patient has children and we need to coordinate rides to and from soccer on Saturdays, whatever it is, making sure that you're there to support each other. 
And then the other thing is giving each other breaks. So I mentioned I lived far away. When I would fly into Charleston, I would make sure that I would give my mother a break because she was the core caregiver. My brother constantly gave my mom breaks when he lived close by. Um, obviously, he worked during the day, so he couldn't do it all the time, but he would check in with my mom and make sure that he could support her. So you want to make sure that when you build this support team, you are constantly supporting each other. And if you are the patient, you want to make sure that is not your job. You get the caregiver to take care of this for you. You should be focusing on your health. The caregiver or that main point person you have should be handling a lot of this. And then they can also spread it out, right? So if that a lot is falling on one person's shoulders and you feel like, you know what, there's someone else, maybe let's say you are the patient and your husband is the care, the main caregiver, but maybe he doesn't like to do all this. This isn't his wheelhouse. This isn't his strength, but you have a daughter who is, has a very strong personality and can set this up. Great. Leverage her. It doesn't have to be the main caregiver. Ask her, will you set up the communication chain with, you know, dad and me and your other siblings? And that way we can all communicate. Can you set up uh, family meetings so we can come together and talk about my care or our next steps or what we need to do? Um, and can you kind of keep an eye an eye on the t everybody in the support team, especially dad, and making sure that he's okay and that he gets a break when needed? We also just want to make sure, and I kind of touched on this already, that you are just aware and keeping an eye on how everyone is doing mentally. Everyone has their own lives as well, and they have other things going on. So whether you're the caregiver or the patient, you know, you want to make sure people, are, like I said, are getting those breaks and that they know that they can go and take some time off and who can come in and support you if you're the patient while they're gone. Again, I would like rely on someone else to kind of manage all this because you need to focus on your health. All right, we're going to switch gears and talk about asking powerful questions. And this is so important for when you're speaking, not just to physicians, but also to nurses, anyone. This, these techniques work for anyone. Number one is preparation is key. So the reason why I have that support team is the number one strategy is because you leverage them to come up with questions, right? So you want to prepare ahead of time. Now, if you're the patient the caregiver, I would start off with the two of you. Write down your questions. You know you have an upcoming doctor's appointment or if you're hospitalized and you know that grand rounds are, or the rounds are the next morning, prepare the night before. And if you are too weak or tired, have the caregiver manage this and handle it. Write down all the questions that you have before you ever see them, because to think of questions on the fly is can be really challenging. It can be overwhelming. And then if you're the patient and you're on, you know, if you happen to be um, on medication at that time, it's making your mind a little fuzzy. That's the last thing you want to do is come up with questions right then. So rely on your team to come up with really good questions. I also want to give you the permission to know that there are no dumb questions. Do not feel that just because you're speaking to a medical professional that you can't ask a question because you feel like you might sound dumb or be embarrassed. Do not worry about that. Your main focus is your health or your loved one's health. Ask whatever you feel is necessary. The medical community has so much jargon that they will unintentionally, and my, I know I do this at work too, we have someone new that comes into the company and we'll use our jargon and they don't know what we're talking about. It's not because we need to do that. We don't mean to exclude someone. It's just part of our everyday language. So make sure that you clarify, you ask questions, whatever you're not clear on, you want to make sure that you're clear. Okay. All right. Next is open versus closed ended probes. So we talk about this a lot in sales. You've got the open-ended questions or questions that start with what, when, who, how. Those questions elicit more information, right? So you basically have, you say, what can I do for exercise? Well, the doctor could give you a whole list of ideas versus can I walk? Closed-ended questions are can, do, is, are. So that's the difference. So closed-ended would be can I go for a walk? Well, yes or no, but maybe there's a lot more you could do exercise-wise versus open-ended questions, which would be, what kind of exercise can I do? Well, now the physician or the nurse or the physical therapist 
occupational therapist, whoever you're speaking to, could say, yeah, you could go for a walk for 10 minutes. You should do the bike for 10 minutes. Um, you know, whatever. Maybe you do yoga. Whatever it is advice they're giving you, depending on your illness. You want to leave that question really open to get more information. Now, it doesn't mean that closed-ended questions are bad. They're not. They also have their use, too. One thing you could use uh, when you could use a closed-ended question is to clarify. And you want to clarify when you are not clear on something. So I mentioned the jargon earlier. That would be a great opportunity to use a closed-ended question. So if they said something about the vital signs monitor, and you could say, okay, I see the vital signs monitor here. Uh, you know, first of all, an open-ended question would be, what is what are these numbers mean? And then they go through it, let's say, and explain them. And then you could say something like, does that mean that I'm in the healthy range for blood pressure? That is you clarifying that specific number about your blood pressure, okay? So write down those, so going back to number one, preparation is key. Think of your questions the day before. If you have an appointment coming up, we would brainstorm with my sister for about a week, knowing that she was gonna meet with her pulmonologist or her oncologist. So we would write all of those questions down. Then we go back and review them. Okay, half of them are closed-ended. If I rework them, I can make them open-ended questions. So there's no pressure. You've got time. You're sitting at home doing this, or maybe in the hospital you're doing this. And use that time to your advantage. And then when the doctor comes in, you have this whole list of questions. I kept it in my phone. That way, it was my phone's always with me. And write down all those questions. You have them. And then you can go right down the line. And I would tell the physician, you know, today I have about six questions I wanted to ask you. So that way the physician is mentally prepared to know that th this is going to take a little bit of time. Maybe you have more than six. Maybe you have 10. Maybe you have 15. We know that doctors are pressed for time. Giving that that heads up helps them to relax a little bit rather than getting anxious that you just keep asking questions. Where is this headed? You know, my family and I came together and we have about 10 questions that we have to ask you today. We just need to clarify some things that we've talked about in the past. That opens up that door. Any other thoughts, Tyler, before I move on? No, I think that's great. Even if you don't have somebody who, in your family who's chronically or terminally ill, I know with my three young boys, my wife has an ongoing list of questions, like you said, on her phone. That way, when you go to the doctor's office, you're not, you don't have a, a blank and you just, you can have them all listed out. And I think you said, like warning the doctor, I, hey, I have three, four, five questions. Um, and then finding a doctor in the book, you do a great job explaining that not all doctors are gonna be a perfect fit for you. Some of them may not want to take the time or they may feel rushed and you may not, you may have to switch doctors and bounce around to, and find one who will take the time to answer that list of questions and really make you feel like you're important and then you're not just a number or a money sign to them, but you're an individual and your health really matters to them or the health of your loved one matters. So I think, yeah, being prepared and asking questions is so great and keeping a list whether it's a physical list written down or on your phone is something awesome to do. Yeah, and you make two great points there. So number one, absolutely, you your health is number one, no matter if you, as you said, you are severely ill or not, it doesn't matter. Even for healthy individuals, your health is so important and you have the right to get good care, great care. And so if you don't feel comfortable, there's not a connection, you're not getting the care you want, you're in charge. So definitely go and seek out a second opinion and find someone that's a better fit. Number two, I'm really glad to have that you brought that up. That when I'm talking about this stuff, I know I keep re referencing my sister because that's when we use these techniques and she was terminally ill. First of all, at the beginning, we didn't know she'd be terminally ill. So we didn't have that mindset. We thought she would get better. But all of these techniques are for anyone. I use them for myself. I'm healthy. I go to the doctor and I always write down even when I have my yearly physicals or whatever, I will write down my questions ahead of time so I don't forget because I will tell you nine times out of 10, if I don't write it down and I've done this many a times, I forget. And then what happens? You leave that office, you're not gonna see them for a year and I'm like, oh my God, I never asked them about X, Y, and Z. So write down those questions. It doesn't matter where you are on the scale of healthy and, and sick. Th these all apply. Okay, so keeping track, we talked about writing down questions. So one thing that we did as a support team, and I think this is really important, if you are brainstorming as a support team, whether it's two of you, or my sister had about, mm, I think there's like six of us, 
So whether it's two or six or 10, I wouldn't probably have more than 10 people on the support team because then it just gets very complicated. Too many hands in the pot. Um, brainstorm with the team, you know, text each other because when you're sitting with that communication chain, whatever it's text or email, however, whatever's easiest, text was best for my family. Um, he found that everyone's brain works differently. So I'll take my brother and I. We just think we have a lot in common, but we think very differently. So if I come up with a question, my brother will come up with a completely different question. I will say, you know, I, I'm, I'm wondering about this, and then I'm wondering about this. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I didn't even think of that. So if you have several people that you can brainstorm with questions, you know, let's say you even have a friend who you're like, my friend is so good at asking good questions because that's their personality. Even if they're not part of your course support team, but you're willing to bring them in and, and share your personal information with them. Again, leverage their strength. They're great at asking questions. What questions could I ask? I've done this with um, my best friend is a three-time cancer survivor. I've given her questions. I'm like, you know what I'm curious about? X, Y, and Z. Can you, when you're, and I'm not there. She lives many states away. Um, I wouldn't be part of her core team, meaning like I'm not there every day, but I'm there to support her. And I want to help her by getting all of her questions answered. So use that, write them down, work together. The other thing that we did that was great was record conversations. So I always like to give this a caveat at the start and say, you need permission. You need permission of the patient. So if you're the patient, you, you have to decide whether you're comfortable with this or not. Um, and then the permission of the person you're speaking to, whether it's the doctor or the nurse. The goal of recording conversations isn't to catch anyone, lawsuits, it's none of that. It has to do with the fact that, and if you're a patient, you probably experience this. Sometimes we feel overwhelmed and there's a lot of information that's being thrown at us, especially when we're sick and maybe there's that jargon again is coming up and you go in and you have the best intention of asking all these questions. And then it, the conversation takes a left turn and suddenly it's going down a road that you didn't expect or you get some bad news. I've had that even, you know, I went through um, fertility treatments and I had some information thrown at me that I just wasn't expecting. And so I would get so focused on that one piece of information that I would forget or not listen to the physician. I think that's very normal. And I think that happens a lot. Recording the conversations will allow you to go back and listen. And then what we did is we shared my, with my sister's permission. We shared those conversations, those recordings with my sister's core team. And what that, what that allowed us to do is listen back, listen to my sister and who was ever with her. Let's say it was my mom, listen to the questions they asked, listen to the responses, and then decide what do we need to follow up on? What are next steps? What do we need to clarify? Um, and it also gave my mom and my sister a break. So let me explain that. I mentioned that I live far away. I want to know what's going on with my sister's health. When they got back at the end of the day from a long doctor's appointment, they got a lot of information. Sometimes it wasn't good feedback. They're overwhelmed. They're mentally and physically exhausted. So for me to ask my mom to recap everything that just happened, I don't think she really felt like doing that. And she would, but I also would get pieces of it. So when we started recording conversations, which wasn't until like six months into my sister's illness, game changer. She could just send me the recording. She didn't have to repeat it. She didn't have to remember. And I could hear everything that was said. So that's that's one of the, the best tips I think I have for you. We're going to talk about handling different conversations. You know, sometimes you get into these conversations. Tyler was alluding to this earlier. Sometimes it's not a good fit with the doctor or maybe you're disagreeing on something. It doesn't mean that you're always a bad fit. Maybe you just aren't comfortable with the next steps or the direction or the protocol that they are using. Difficult conversations are going to happen and it's OK. And just remember, it's your health, so you're in charge. Even though sometimes it doesn't feel like it, you need to be the one in charge. Or if you're the caregiver and you're the voice for the patient, you are the one that's in charge if they can't be their own voice. So th these are techniques I'm gonna walk you through that we use for handling a difficult conversation. Number one, when someone says something that you don't agree with, you wanna acknowledge what they said. The point of that is if we go right into combating and disagreeing, then both sides of the conversation have shut down. Nobody is listening. So you wanna make sure you acknowledge. Then make sure you ask questions, clarify, understand, go back to those open probes. I'm not sure that I'm clear on this. What do you mean by X, Y, and Z? When you say this, are you meaning X, Y, and Z? Okay, so clarify to make sure that you're clear because maybe it's just a miscommunication. 
and the conversation might end there. If not, now it's your opportunity to explain your side, what you feel, what you think. So make sure that you are prepared, especially if you can be, if you're going into a conversation, you know you're gonna have a, a difficult conversation with someone, come prepared to explain your side. Have your bullet, point, point, bullet points written down. And then last but not least, you wanna to come to an agreement. This may not happen so quickly, but this is kind of the system that you want to follow, A-A-E-A. -A -E -A. So you want to acknowledge what they say. You want to ask questions to make sure that you're understanding. Then explain your side so you do get a voice. Don't think that you're just listening to them. Then it's your turn to say, OK, well, this is how I understand it, or this is my concerns, or this is the direction I wanted to take my help. And then come to an agreement at the end. And that agreement could be you're moving in one direction, you understand each other, and you're on board. Or the agreement could be that you do need to go find another physician because you just are not aligned. Okay. And last but not least, I wanted to share the powerful morning routine that I do share in the book. And I did come up with journals. Um, I published those the beginning of last year, so 2022. And so these are also on Amazon. And these are really for the caregiver. The patient can use them, but I think the questions are much more geared towards caregivers. Regardless of what's in the journal, this morning routine can be used by patients as well. So five R's. Number one is reflect. And I would recommend you do this first thing in the morning before the day gets overwhelming and you get busy with everything that life is throwing at you. Reflect. You want to reflect on your thoughts and feelings. There's a lot going on, whether you are the patient, you're taking care of someone else, there's just a lot internally, and sometimes we get up and get our day started, and we don't think about what are we dealing with. So take that time to think through it. Journal is a great way to reflect upon your thoughts and feelings. Then you want to review the day's plan. So look at your calendar. Look at your phone. What is happening today? Do you have a doctor's appointment? Um, does someone need to take you somewhere, or do you need to take someone else somewhere? Uh, what is what is going on the day? You want to make sure if you can plan in the morning. I actually like to plan this part the night before, to be honest, because then I know and I'm not late for anything first thing in the morning if my day starts early. But whenever it works for you that morning, night before, plan out that day so you know I have to be here at this time. You're not feeling rushed. You're not stressed. Re examine the patient's care. So whether this is for yourself or someone else, think about what is going on with your care and if you need any changes. Do you need a second opinion? Um, do you need a refill on your medication? It could be something minor, it could be something major. Re-examine what's going on. Do you need to listen to a recording again because you just met with the doctor yesterday and you kind of forget what they said? That's gonna happen. Maybe take that time to listen to that recording and make notes. Maybe now you have follow-up questions. Reevaluate the team. So this isn't about firing anyone necessarily. It could be, but you know, if you have your core support team, maybe there's that six of you, let's say, and you realize that someone else on that support team, I'm just making up an example, maybe they are having a tough time. Let's say it's a cousin of yours and their dog just died. Maybe they need a break for now. Maybe they just, you know, aren't mentally there. They're not there for you the way that they need to be. And you need to have a conversation. You know, I want you to go relax. Don't worry about me for now, whatever. Um, in my scenario with my sister, what we would do is just reevaluate. My brother and I, a lot of times, would talk about my mom and is she doing okay? She had lost my father. Now she's got a sick daughter. You know, how can we support her? Um, so just think about the team as a whole. Of course, the patient is always the center of all of this, and they're the ones that need the most love and attention. We don't want to forget about the support team members too, because if they are sick, if they're not mentally well or physically well, they can't support the patient. And then last but not least, and certainly probably most important, is recharge. You need self-care. Everybody does. So what is that for you? For me, it's probably meditation. I always feel better after I meditate. I try and do it on a daily basis. Um, exercise maybe might be one. Maybe it's prayer. Whatever it is for you. Take that five to 10 minutes. If it's exercise and someone needs to like go exercise for 30 minutes, great. And you can manage that in your schedule. Awesome. Do that. But even if it's just five to 10 minutes of recharging before you start your day, it's a it's a, just a beautiful way to end this morning routine. Tyler, any questions on this or thoughts? 
I don't think so. I think that's great. And thanks for bringing up the fact that there is a journal that you've made that they can access as well and purchase to use. Yeah. Yep. And it leads you through the five R's. So if you get the journal, you know, it will, there's a reflection question to start off the morning. So if you don't know how to kind of explore your thoughts and feelings, that's the point point of the journal. And that's why I created it because I thought some people might not know like what to bring up. So I ask you a different question every single day in the journal. And then there's space for the day's plan and the patient care and evaluating the team. That's there's space for that just big blank page with kind of some guidance there. And then um, I also the recharge isn't necessarily a part of the book because that's something you need to do on your own. But there is an inspirational quote too to hopefully kind of bring you some peace or get you to think about some things. And that's it. Thank you so much, Erin. That was wonderful. Mm -hmm. And um, I, that was just like a little like tease or like snippet into what your book is. It goes into such depth. And at the end of every chapter I love or every one of the badass strategies, there's eight of them. There's actionable items that you can put into place and you can check them off as you do them. And so I feel like there's no holes in the book, like everything that you would need, whether you're hurt, you're helping someone that's terminally ill, chronically ill, or like a lot of our patients at our clinics have exacerbations in those moments, they probably do need extra support. And so knowing these beforehand would be very helpful. That way you're not dealing with all the emotional like stress and sadness of a diagnosis, but you already kind of know beforehand, like this is what the game plan. If I, if you've read this book beforehand, then you're completely, I feel like prepared to handle the situation as best possible. Yeah. Well, thank you. That's, that was really the goal because I mentioned I was in the pharmaceutical industry for over 20 years. You don't need 20 years to figure this stuff out, you know, and my goal in writing the book was to help family members and patients kind of fast forward that, that process where they can learn it by reading or listening to the book. And the action items, actually, it's so funny you say that about the action items at the end of every chapter, because I think that's the number one compliment I get on the book. People love the action items, which I understand because I'm a cheat sheet kind of girl. I need like a, you know, just give me some quick things that I can do and they're very actionable. So I hope that helps. Thank you. Is it okay if I just ask you a couple questions before yeah, we close? Absolutely. Um, so, so the strategy number four is to record important conversations like you were saying. Um, and some doctors might not feel comfortable with that. Is there like a waiver or like a, is there something that could, you could sign saying, I'm not going to sue you or like hold you verbatim for what you said? Uh, like, have you ever experienced pushback or is that something common? Yeah, that's a great question. There is not a waiver that I have. And I don't know if you'd really want to do that in case something went wrong, you know, if you want to lock yourself into that. But I, A, we never had an issue. Um, okay. Now, that doesn't mean that someone's not going to come across that, right? Um, but I think the key is to upfront explain why you want to record the conversation. And so we always, when it was a new physician that we had not recorded, we always said, you know, is it okay if we record this for my mom who's not here today? Or is it okay if we record this because my sister lives in Texas and she wants to hear this conversation? We never had an issue. Now, I have recommended this to so many people. I've had one friend that came back and said one, while well, well, his wife was sick, one doctor said he would prefer not. That's probably, that may happen every once in a while. If that happens, then your notebook, which you should always have some type of notebook with you, just to keep track of appointments and all that good stuff, then take your notes there and just do your best to take your notes with that physician. I also would wonder like, why are they giving that pushback? And maybe you don't have that rapport, that trusted rapport yet with them, that could be it. Um, but that would be my best advice. Or take the, the notes, handwritten, and then also I would maybe ask why they aren't comfortable with that and make sure that you are explaining what you're doing with that recording. Thank you. I think that's wonderful. As long as you preface it and you're not trying to be like sneaky about recording and the doctor's like, what's going on? I think that would make a big difference. Yeah, definitely don't be sneaky. You know, there's HIPAA rule laws and everything. So I don't, I, I just worry you could get yourself into trouble if you didn't ask someone permission. And certainly if you're not the patient, the patient also needs to be on board because that's definitely violating HIPAA laws if the patient is not approving this as well. So the patient and the provider that are being recorded, they're the ones that need to give you the thumbs up that it's okay. Thanks, Aaron. Yeah. The second one, I like the quote in your book, you said knowledge is power. I know a lot of our patients are elderly, they're seniors, and there's so much information on the internet. When you yes. were going through and looking at different information about Megan's diagnosis, how can they know what, if a website is good, bad, if it's legitimate, or if 
it's yeah fishy great question so on my website i actually for this reason i have links it's called reliable links and the pharmacy the company that i've worked for they have um pharmacists or doctors who you know work for these companies and they have certain websites that they use and these are some government websites so i have those links on there where you can research diseases medication it's not going to be like it, they're reliable websites so that's one thing number two is if you're not comfortable with the computer with the cell phone doing your research that is going back to my tip of leverage someone that you know that is good at that if you're if that's not your strength research which it's not necessarily my strength not something i love to do i'll do it i did for my sister to some degree but it's not my strength but my husband it's his strength so i can leverage him and say can you kind of do some research here so use those younger people that are great with the computer. They know where to look. You can send them to my website if you need a starting spot. Um, but definitely, I can understand it's overwhelming. And you don't want to Google. Just don't put it into Google in general. Make sure that you go to those reliable websites. WebMD is great. There's some that you will get some, some good feedback. The other thing is I was in a doctor's office this week, and he had a quote on the wall that said something like, something about Google. He didn't want people, it was a joke about Googling. You know, I, your Google search does not <laughs> trump my years of medical school, something like that. It was really funny. So we talked about it. I was like, I love that sign. He said, well, so many patients come in and they've Googled something and they think they're dying. And I'm like, you're fine. You're fine. You just freaked yourself out for no reason. And I think we've all done that. That's why we can laugh about it. Right. So make sure that you're also not going crazy where you're driving yourself nuts, you know, do your research. So you do have some powerful information that you can ask questions about. Come prepared with those questions, write them down and make sure that you're using those reliable websites, like I said, that I've given you. Thank you. The last thing that I, well, I love lots of things about your book, but the last part that really resonated with me is I struggle with mental health, anxiety, depression. And if I had a terminal diagnosis for myself or a loved one, mental health counseling, a grief counselor you mentioned in your book would be great. Um, what like short little, a minute or two pitch could you give for someone who has a mental or sorry has a health challenge why would seeking out a mental health counselor or like psychologist psychiatrist why would that be important um so this is a great question that you're asking me and i don't ever get asked this so number one there should be no shame in going and speaking to someone i always say that you know when we grow up we have math tutors and we have sports coaches but we are not taught how to deal with our emotions and our feelings and that is probably the most important thing for any all of our health, right, is how to deal with what we're, what's going on internally. So number one, you, you can seek out psychologists, psychologist, um, counselor. I, you know, if it's, if you're taking care of someone and they are terminal, also go seek out that grief counselor, because even though they're still here, you're still dealing with the grief of, you know, you're losing someone that, you know, that's going to happen. And then, and then they'll they be there afterwards too, to support you. Just talking about your feelings, it can be really hard and uncomfortable for a lot of us, but I think it's such a gift to get someone to help you work through those feelings. Um, there's also, if you don't like the pressure to be on you, you can do group counseling. I've done both. They both were wonderful. Um, I'm okay with talking about my feelings, but you know, it was really nice after my sister passed away to be in a group setting where I could relate to others. So it doesn't just have to be with death. It can just be with dealing with what's going on. And then the last thing that I would say is, if you are the patient or if you're advocating for a patient, also look into palliative care. So palliative care is not hospice. They do not have to be dying terminal to leverage palliative care. Palliative care are healthcare professionals. A lot of them are social workers or they have a background in psychology and they are there to support you. It's pretty much like comfort care is what I call it. So you have the doctors that are gonna take care of the disease. These are doctors and nurses and professionals who are gonna help you with your mental health, they will help you with pain. So if you need any meds for pain, they can prescribe things. They also will handle, if, if necessary, they can handle some end of life conversations, those difficult conversations. So if you have a patient or if you were the patient, you're in and out of the hospital, leverage the palliative care team. They are fantastic. Thank you, Aaron. that is great advice. Um, so thanks again for meeting with us and I appreciate your vulnerability with sharing the story of your father and then also your sister. I know okay. it's gotta be tough talking about it so much, but I'm grateful that you're willing to be vulnerable and share your story. That way people can learn from it and learn from your expertise as a 
pharmaceutical rep and all the trainings and speak or like the um, speeches that you give, it is very beneficial and I've learned a lot. So this is my last pitch. Please go check out her book, Badass Advocate. You can find it on Amazon. Also, please go to her website, badassadvocate.com. I wanted to close with a quote. I can pull out my cell phone quickly um, from her book. Not a quote from Aaron directly, but a quote from, um, and it's also at the bottom of her website. And it says this, there are only four kinds of people in the world. Those who have been caregivers, those who are currently caregivers, those who will be caregivers, and those who will need caregivers. So I truly believe that no matter where we are in life, at some point, we will fall into one of those four categories. And as we educate ourselves, just like with any topic, knowledge is power, we'll be prepared, like Aaron said, um, that when the time comes where we are in the caregiver position or we need a caregiver, we know how to build a support team, we know how to ask questions. And please um, check out her book. And thanks again, Aaron, for meeting with me. I really appreciated the conversation we had and the presentation you gave. Thanks, Tyler. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Have That's a good a luck to everyone. Thanks, you too. Have a good weekend.